knowledge, used 172 times in 169 verses of the Bible. The art of defeating ignorance and gaining knowledge, both divine and natural. The terror of God is rarely talked about, but it's real. What are we talking about? Stay there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemp. And I'm Janice. This is Quick Study, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. Now, we go through that Bible, and today that brings us to, well, Amos chapters 8 through 9. Now, I call this one digging into hell. What in the world am I talking about? Actually, the terror of God keeps us, it's actually in some uh, translations I call it the fear of God, mm -hmm. keeps us, the reality of, of the result of sin, keeps us on the straight and narrow. That is a good thing. And so we'll talk about that, I guarantee you. Not many churches talking about this today. That's coming up in a few moments. Right now, Corey helps us put this all in context with Bible history and archaeology. Corey? Today we are going to be talking about the high places that were set up in northern Israel by King Jeroboam. Yeah, okay, King Jeroboam, the, the, are you going to talk about the first King Jeroboam? Yes, the first one. The first guy with not a good guy. Uh, very interesting. All right, so what do we have for Do You Know? Do you know what kind of famine Amos prophesies? Very, very interesting, and we'll talk about that coming up, but similar to maybe some things today. Mm -hmm. And that and more coming up, but right now, going to save some time for later on where we'll talk more about God's judgment. But here's Corey with Bible Archaeology and Bible History. Amos is alive and prophesying during the time period of the kings when northern Israel was still a nation. It had not yet been taken over by Assyria. However, um, Amos, along with many other prophets, is prophesying the destruction of northern Israel because of the apostasy that was set up by King Jeroboam, who was um, reigning during the time period of Rehoboam, the generation after Solomon. Take a look at this. Newly selected King Jeroboam ruled over his ten tribes from the city of Shechem. He quickly began to fear that he would lose his unsure hold on Israel if he allowed the people to travel back to Jerusalem. It was in Rehoboam's territory that they were to offer their sacrifices and honor the Lord's commands. Jeroboam instituted replacements, two golden calves that he set up in so-called high places, one at the city of Bethel and another at Dan. Bethel has not yet been excavated and examined, but extraordinary finds at Dan stand as a stark reminder of Israel's sin against God. A large high place has indeed been found, Stairs lead up to its man-made platform that stands 10 feet high. Here, somewhere on this platform at Dan, the idol would have stood. Remnants of many sacrificed animals were found, along with the horned altars that they would have been sacrificed on before a golden image of one of their own. Various cultic utensils and smaller incense altars were scattered around in abundance. The discoveries here at Dan clearly illustrate 
what the Bible portrays. It's time to study the wise guys of the Bible and they are all around us. Today in our reading of Amos chapter 8 through 9, we focus on the wise guy Amos who reports the words of the Almighty God, who says this, Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Now God promises to deal with all rebellion in all time throughout all of humanity. God is a just God. And the wise guy Amos has been called to confront the unjust, bloody violations that stretch into the filth of spiritual darkness. God himself tells the prophet that he is standing by waiting to strike. When the people of God desperately dig their way into hell for a respite, God will strike them there and for their willful, deliberate rebellion, he will punish them. Hard words from Amos. Amos 9, 1 through 10. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the doorposts, that the thresholds may shake and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with the sword. He who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search and take them. Though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword, and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. The Lord of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell there mourn, all of it shall swell like the river and subside like the river of Egypt. He who builds his layers in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. Are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me, O children of Israel, says the Lord? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from Kaphtor, and the Syrians from Kerr? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. For surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all nations as grain is sifted in a sieve yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say, the calamity shall not overtake nor confront us. Amos chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. You're watching Quick Study Television. You're listening to Quick Study Radio. And today I want to talk to you about something that is not politically correct. And frankly, I don't care because it's the truth. It may not be politically correct to talk about the terror of God or the fear of God, but I don't care. It needs to be talked about and it's true. Now, let me see if I can explain myself through Amos, God's angry man. You know that Tanakh, that beautiful piece of scripture that is just as much the part of scripture as the New Testament that people don't want to read? Well, I want to read it, and we've been going through it in these beautiful 39 books of the Bible. Amos chapter 9, verses 1 to 4. Let's begin. The prophet speaks to God's people, and he says, I saw the Lord standing by the altar. And he said, Strike the doorposts that the thresholds may shake and break them on the heads of all. 
I will slay the last of them with the sword. Who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, from there my hand will take them. Though they climb into heaven, from there my will will bring them down. Though they hide themselves among the top of Carmel, from there I will stretch and take them. Though they hide from me at the sight of the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. Verse 4. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword and it shall slay them. And I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. Now that sounds like a very angry God, doesn't it? But to put context into this whole thing, you need to understand something. For decades, for hundreds of years, the people have been shaking their fist at God and saying, get out of here. We don't want you anymore. And God has poured out his mercy for centuries. And there comes a time of judgment when God is looked at as nothing more than a nuisance. God moves in and tells the truth. Wise guys know that. And so the first point is this. The terror of God is rarely taught in today's church, causing many to play with sin and dig into hell for fun. Christians playing with all kinds of things, Ouija boards and the occult, those who are Bible believers playing with all of this kind of stuff. And I know this isn't politically correct, but like I say, I don't care. It's my opinion from the Bible, and I believe it. Beloved, stay away from the things which the Bible in the Greek calls debauchery, playing with demons. Stay away from that. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, stay away from that. I'm talking to the church. Those who are non-believers are going to do what they're going to do. But if those who are believers say they are believers in Jesus Christ, then why, I ask you, why are you consulting with so-called angels when Jesus himself says, come to me, all you who labor under heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amos continues, chapter 9, verse 5. The Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell there more, all of it shall swell like the river and subside like the river of Egypt. He who builds his layers in the sky, fascinating, layers of atmosphere and ionosphere in the sky. He who builds his layers in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Beloved, listen, the terror of God is a good thing because it teaches us of the absolute authority of God and we adjust our attitudes accordingly. You see, it is a good thing to recognize God is all-powerful and there will be discipline from the Holy Spirit. Yes, there is grace from Jesus. Of course there's grace. But James the just in the New Testament said it this way, faith without works is dead. In other words, faith causes you to want to love Jesus more than you love your sin. There will be a change in your lifestyle for those who are serious about God. Those who are playing around, God will deal with. Amos 9 verse 7 says, Are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me, O children of Israel, says the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaptor and the Syrians from Kerr? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. For surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all of the nations as grain is sifted in the sieve. Yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. And all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say the calamity shall not overtake us nor confront us. Beloved, the terror of God is known to the demons of hell itself. And we can hide behind the terror of God when we repent to our Lord. James chapter 2, verses 18 through 19 also say, you believe, well, that's great. Even the demons of hell believe and shudder at the name of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something? I don't want a big buddy from the sky. When it comes to dealing with Satan, when it comes to dealing with the demon uh, demonics that try to attack me, strike me and haunt my life, I don't want a big buddy in the sky for my God. I want a soldier that I see in Revelation 19. I want the warrior king, Jesus Christ, to defend me that I can hide behind his shield. I can hide behind his strength. I can hide behind his power. 
Whatever happened to that image of Jesus Christ in today's world? It's like society has tried to domesticate Jesus. Whatever happened to the reality that Jesus is the warrior king as described in the book of Revelation? And beloved, the terror of God is a good thing. It is the fear of God that men depart from evil by mercy and truth is iniquity purged and by the fear of God do men depart from evil. Let us have and pray for a revival in our land of the fear of God. Not a revival of signs and wonders and spiritual amusement parks, but a revival of the fear of God that we might come into His commands and live for Him. God spoke about the destruction of northern Israel, many times they also spoke about the punishment coming to other nations that surrounded northern Israel that were involved in the politics of the day. Now, one of these nations is, of course, the Philistines. They're mentioned over and over and over again, not just here in Amos, but in other prophetic books. Right now, we're going to take a look at some of the destruction of the Philistine cities by Assyria. Sargon II, king of Assyria, appears in the historical accounts of the Bible, and his endeavor for power would change Israel and Judah forever. Sargon's name means the king is legitimate, which gives further evidence to the likely truth that Sargon was actually a usurper to his brother's throne. The king that Sargon took over from was Shalmaneser V, documented in the Bible and his own records as the king who besieged Samaria, the capital city of northern Israel. Something funny happens in the Assyrian records at this point. Shalmaneser's records go quiet, and Sargon's records claim the victory of the destruction of Samaria. Likely, Sargon staged a revolt and took the throne as the destruction of Samaria was coming to a close. Sargon then takes responsibility for the deportation of Israelites. According to the Bible, all of this took place during the co-regency of King Hezekiah with his father Ahaz in the southern kingdom of Judah. At this time, there was a prominent prophet of God writing a large book in the Bible, Isaiah son of Amos. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet actually dates some of his prophecies according to the actions of the Assyrian kings. One such example comes from Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1, that claims Sargon was king of Assyria and sent his chief commander to the city of Ashdod to destroy it. From Sargon's records discovered at his palace complexes, we learn he did, in fact, take credit for capturing Ashdod. The excavation of Ashdod also verifies this in a large destruction level at the site and the discovery of victory monuments built by Sargon and left in the conquered city. Even the detail of Sargon sending his commander into battle is verified by records that have Sargon at home during those years of battle overseeing construction. Equidistant lettering, the Bible codes. This phenomenon does not occur in any other religious books or in any other ancient literature, not in Homer's Iliad or in the writings of Josephus. It doesn't occur in recent history, medieval writings, Shakespeare, or other poets. This mysterious code occurs only in the 66 books of the Bible. But what is the Bible code? And is it important to Bible believers? Is it a dangerous cult seduction? Or is it authentic? Join Rod, Janice, and Corey Hembry in a special never-released one-hour DVD video about the Bible codes and what they really mean. We also need your help this summer and your support. We are supported by viewers just like you. We will send you the Never Seen DVD Bible Code with Rod, Janice, and Corey Hembry when you write or call. Our suggested donation is a gift of $20 or more. 
You can write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Or in Canada and the rest of the world, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also call for faster service at 724-733-8336 or 519-940-8338. We continue to study the book of Amos. This is an amazing guy. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about somebody who has a great deal of political or economic authority, but we're talking about someone who responded to God. And the message that he brings is not mm -hmm. a popular message. And so, Corey, with that in mind, Janice has some questions for us. Let's yes. take a listen to it. So do you know what kind of famine Amos prophesies here in Amos 8 and 9? All right, so what kind of famine does Amos the prophet prophesy, Corey? Yes, this one is interesting. It's a, it's a famine of the word of God. In fact, I think the words are there's a famine in the land, but not of bread and not of water, but of every word of God. That's right. Let's hear it. Amos 8, verses 11 through 12. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Verse 12, they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Now, this is a prophecy of the future. Really interesting. Uh, two things, Corey, first of all, on Friday nights at the church, we do something called Open Forum. Mm -hmm. And it's with the 20 something. And what surprises me, Corey, you lead that forum. What surprises me is the absolute hunger of these young people to understand the principles, the absolute principles from the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Well, we're searching for a foundation. What's happened in the Western culture is that there are no more boundaries. There are no more rules. There are no more right and wrong. We have a lot of, you know, social etiquette, but we don't have a lot of actual morality going around. And people are searching for that. So we want a foundation. We want something that we can stand on, something that we can hold on to, to make sense of this life, of the world. So that's what we're finding. And I'm encouraged by that, Janice, because yes. when we sit there, you and I are the invited guests, you know, and every time they need somebody to antagonize the conversation, <laughs> I usually pipe up and, you know, antagonize the conversation with another thought. But the idea is that to, to do critical thinking and to work through, Corey, what do we mean by critical thinking? What does that mean? <clears throat> Well, not just taking someone's word for a truth or a fact, but actually using your brain and using your heart to be able to uh, divide and understand what's going on and to be challenged with the uh, conclusions that you have made in your own life. There are other people there and also the word of God to challenge uh, those beliefs. And really, um, we come out of it on the other side once we've thought critically, we've had our positions challenged and we've honestly asked the question, am I wrong? Am I right? Where is truth in this? You come away with a better understanding um, of, of what life is. Not being taught today. In fact, today it's all about following the crowd. It's about peer review. It's about your, what your friends on Facebook think. It's about Twitter. And a lot of people, you know, you talk about different movements, political movements like Occupy Wall Street and all this other stuff. And nobody was thinking, they were just doing uh, based on a slogan. Uh, but nobody really thought about what was really going on or what they were really doing there. And the question is, that I mean, that's great if you want to stand up for what's right. But, you know, my friend, Franklin Graham, when people were occupying, he was feeding people who were dying of starvation. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Franklin Graham, he was over there dealing with people who didn't have any water, clean water. And so rather than do that, we need to get out there and do something to make a difference. And that was the key. And so critical thinking also means challenging what your friends are saying, whether that's true or not. And so here's Amos, and he's saying, you know, the problem here is that there's a famine of God's Word. God's Word teaches us to, to change things. God's Word doesn't teach us to just sit back and follow the crowd. God's Word teaches us to be exceptional in the culture, not acceptable to the culture. 
And so that is the whole point. I'm starting to preach. I better settle down because <laughs> we only have like 30 seconds left. Anyway, uh, it really today, it's important for us to not just take everybody else's word on it. Take the word of God. Critical thinking doesn't mean you dismiss authority. It means you understand the foundation of the authority. It means you seek it out and develop it in your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart, Psalm 119 says, that I might not sin against thee. And that's why the Bible says in Proverbs that without a vision, the, the people, people perish. perish. And also it says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from the destru destruction. But when you detach absolutes, you're going to have moral anarchy. You're going to have chaos. That's the kind of world you're going to create. So now is the time for us to get founded in the word of God. words of the Tanakh, the Old Testament, are just as much the Holy Bible as the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The prophecies of Amos are scripture, and God does not change. His wrath will be poured out upon sin and those who lovingly embrace sin. God's wisdom is at work in us when we realize just how graceful and powerful the blood of Jesus Christ is. Born-again believers are protected from the terror of God's wrath against sin and find favor in his face only because of the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So with that, we pray, Lord, teach me to understand your nature and realize the power of your grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is time to wise up in our Wise Up segment here on Quick Study. Now, Today we're looking at Proverbs chapter 20, the very first verse, chapter 20, verse 1. Listen carefully to what it says. Wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. What an amazing statement. It means that there is a kind of spirit with the revelry of alcohol. There is. How many people do we see in our workplace? How many people do we hear? I'm going to go get drunk. And it's like we desire to lose our minds and give it up to anybody out there. And here the Bible tells us and warns us, wine is a mocker. Let me tell you something. I have seen alcoholics healed. I've seen people who have trouble in this area completely changed by the power of Jesus Christ. If you're struggling in this area, I want to bring you this hope. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is stronger than that spirit of alcohol. And I encourage you to pray and let him come into your life and help you. Pray and say, Jesus, I need help in this area. I am addicted and I need somebody to come in. You are the higher power. Thank you for joining us today on Quick Study. Remember, you can get the full impact of this ministry by going to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com.